Welcome to our opening keynote session. I'm honored to have a conversation with Dr. Catherine Abraham on the economic impact of COVID-19. Dr. Abraham is a professor of economics and survey methodology at the University of Maryland. She was commissioner of the US Bureau of Labor Statistics from 1993 to 2001 and a member of the Council of Economic Advisors from 2011 to 2013. Dr. Abraham, welcome. It's really nice to be here, John. I appreciate the invitation. And we appreciate hearing from you about the impact of uh, COVID-19 on the economy. So uh, before we get into that topic, as I mentioned, you're teaching at the University of Maryland. How has the pandemic uh, impacted the way that the university is educating its students? Well, as you can imagine, the you know, shutdown of in-person classes came as a, a big shock to the higher education system, and that was certainly true at Maryland. Um, we've been working really hard to move everything online and, and still maintain connections with, with students. Um, you know, I, I think like a lot of other organizations, we've learned some things. There, there are some advantages to having some of our material online rather than just in the classroom, but I think I speak for most of my colleagues. We're really looking forward to getting back to in-person education. As are we at WCRI, for sure. Yeah. So how about testing of, of students? Is there a way that you can test? And uh, or do is anyone concerned about the integrity of, of testing? Um, that certainly is a concern. The classes I teach tend to be smaller, so I can have the students doing their exams online and watch them while they're taking them. Um, one of my classes, I've always given a take home exam anyway. So you know, open book, open note. But yes, in the bigger classes, that, that's been something people have wrestled with. Yeah, I can imagine. So maybe we could turn to the uh, pandemic and its impact on the economy. Um, at the macro level, how has the pandemic induced shutdown and the subsequent recovery differed from previous recessions. And I'm thinking in particular that there are some differences in the industry sectors and the occupations that have been impacted by the pandemic. Yeah, that's that's certainly true. Um, you know, just just in think in terms of thinking broadly about how this recession has been different than than past recessions. Normally, when you start getting into a recession, economic activity starts slowing down and then employment starts to fall and it's a much more gradual process. But with this recession, between early March and the middle of April, bam, we just shed millions of jobs. So there was this really sharp, really fast downturn like nothing we've ever seen before. Um, as, your, as your question suggests, Another big difference was the, the sorts of sectors that were affected. Um, looking back to the what we have been calling the Great Recession, the 2007 to 2009 recession, uh, if you looked at where spending fell in that recession, it was almost all durable goods, non-durable goods. In this recession, it's almost all been services. It's spending on the kinds of things that people don't want to buy anymore because they involve in-person contact that doesn't feel safe. So it's restaurants, it's hotels, it's air travel, um, personal services. What you might notice my hair is looking a little bit shaggy. <laughs> you know, I've Looks great. really tried to avoid the content that comes with getting the hair cut. So you know, me and a lot of other people so that's been a big difference. And then that, that has implications for the people who've been affected. The, the people who work in these affected industries disproportionately are people who are relatively low paid rather than relatively high paid. And so you've seen a very disproportionate impact on you know, the, the people who work in restaurants and hotels and so on, you, people in these service occupations. So if you compare you know, how much employment has fallen for high paid people, it, it hasn't been very much and it's largely recovered. The, the, the people who have been really hard hit have been the, pe the, the lower paid people in these service occupations who have just you know, 
they've, they've lost jobs that haven't come back yet. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, it's kind of interesting that if you look at how um, you know, spending has changed and that you know, and how that shows up in, in employment, people, it, lower income people, thanks to unemployment assistance and, and, and other things, their employment has fallen a lot. Their spending hasn't fallen as much. Where the big drops in spending have been, have been on higher paid people who aren't buying these services, which then has implications for employment. Interesting. So, um, well, so maybe I could ask you about long-term employment because you kind of alluded to that in terms of some of these sectoral impacts. So uh, to what extent has the data that uh, the BLS produces uh, indicated that there is uh, some, uh, some long-term unemployment and what would be the implications of that long-term unemployment for the yeah, future la labor market prospects? I mean, that's a really good question. And that, that's of course, you know, part of the reason for being concerned about these employment impacts that have now dragged on. When the recession started, there were a lot of people who were on temporary layoff. You can see that in the, the BLS data. Um, so most of those people who were out of work in March, April last year said that they were on temporary layoff. But as time has gone on, some of them have been called back, but then a, a significant number of those temporary layoffs have turned into permanent layoffs. And you know, over time, the, the, the length of time that those people have been out of work has gone up. The latest data that the DLS has put out are the data for February, 2021. And in February, the share of the unemployed who had been out of work for six months or more uh, rose up above 40%. So that, that's kind of like the levels that we were seeing and we're so concerned about during the Great Recession, the 2007 to 2009 recession. And it's really a concern because once people have been out of work for a long time, we know that their chances of finding a job are lower. Um, we know that being long-term unemployed has adverse effects on you know, their mental health, their physical health. The effects of, of being laid off and then becoming long-term unemployed can last for decades. It can you know, show up in worse health and, and higher rates of mortality you know, long, a long time down the road. So it's really a concern. Um, so um, there's been some discussion about women being uh, disproportionately affected because they are spending, having to spend more time, sort of a sexist view, but I think unfortunately perhaps true that, mm -hmm. that women have been bearing the burden of, of taking care of the children in the home and they might be dispro disproportionately affected by the prospects of long-term unemployment. Is that in the data from the BLS? So it's, a, it's a little hard to tease some of that out of the data. I, I think what's going, it, it is true that, that especially early on, women were proportionately more affected in terms of employment losses than, than men. Some of, to some extent that's been reversed, but um, you know, it's, it, it's not to say that people aren't, you know, women aren't you know, more likely to work part-time when they would have been working full-time before and so on. Um, it may or may not show up in the data on long-term unemployment because some of these women have just left the labor force. So if you're not actively looking for work, you're going to not show you're not going to show up as unemployed, and therefore you won't show up as long-term unemployed. But I, I think there definitely is an issue there. Um, I'm a little more optimistic about um, women being able to re-enter the, you know, re-enter employment. Um, you know, we, we have evidence from other 
sources about you know, long-term unemployment being a, a bad thing in terms of, of finding another job. In studies where resumes have been sent to employers and they've you know, either called people in or not called people in, being long-term unemployed reduces the chances you get called in. But the group that's not true for is women, you know, prime age women, slightly older women. And so maybe it, once we've gotten through all of this, employers will be sympathetic to why these women weren't working and it might not be so bad, but I guess we'll see. So maybe we could pivot to talk a little bit about um, education. So mm -hmm. of course, many students have been learning at home over the past year. And so one might surmise, I don't know if there's any real uh, evidence on this, but that the quality of their education at home from learning at home is not quite the same as it would be at, at school. Mm -hmm. And uh, so if that's the case, are there any implications for the future labor market success of, of our current students? Well, we, are, we actually are starting to get data about that. And it, it does seem to be the case that students have been learning less during the pandemic than during normal times. Uh, the, the data that I've seen look at what has happened to test scores from the 2019-2020 school year, so early on in the pandemic. And what those suggest is that students, you know, K through 12 students weren't learning as much last year as they would in a normal year, that they're behind by months maybe. And as this has dragged on, you, I would expect that's only gonna be, be worse. We, we have a chance to make this up. School districts are talking about extending the school year or offering summer school. We know that if we could, you know, when, when students come back, if we could identify the ones that have really fallen behind and give them extra tutoring, that, that that could help to make up the difference. So there's things that we can do, and I hope we do them. They all cost money. Um, I, I was very happy to see in the, in the latest relief bill, uh, a significant amount of money for education that should help with, with some of that, but we, we do have work we're gonna need to do. The group that I'm particularly, I mean, I'm worried about that group, but I'm also really worried about the people who are you know, stopping their education, if you will. Last year, the high school graduation rate didn't suffer. It wasn't any lower than it usually is, but I'm worried about people having dropped out of high school this year as this is dragged on. And then we know that the, the number of people going on to college, going on to college from high school to college has fallen off a lot. And it's particularly fallen off among community college enrollments, which is you know, often the route for you know, relatively disadvantaged students to get into higher education. And the reason I'm really worried about that is that once your, your education gets interrupted, it, it, it may be hard to get you back into the pipeline. And so I, I think that's another group we really want to be paying attention to. So your remarks are sort of alluding to this, but um, maybe I'll probe a little bit more ab about this issue, about whether there are any potential disparities. I'm thinking that there are, for example, um, differences in access to uh, in-person teaching because yeah. of jurisdictional differences, uh, also where kids go to school. There's also issues about uh, uh, different income levels, folks at different income levels having different access to technology that would facilitate uh, learning at home. So yeah. do you are you concerned about potential disparities going down the road in terms of the acquisition of human capital and uh, subsequently uh, in future labor market? Yeah, success? thank you. Thank you for really highlighting that issue. I, I should have been more explicit about that. Absolutely. Um, you, you can see, as you suggested, by income level, that's also associated with by, by race, big differences in access to technology and that in the data we have so far translates into you know, African-American kids, Hispanic kids suffering more in terms of learning losses than, than white kids. You know, more generally, 
you know, low income kids are doing worse than higher income kids. And, and that is a real concern. Um, and I mean, if, it, it's also, I think I sort of said, I said this already, it, it's, you're seeing the same kind of disparate impact when it comes to continuing on in education, making that transition from high school to college. Do you think there's some chance that the, um, the latest uh, belief bill will address this disparity to a certain extent? To a certain extent, I, I, I hope it will, but I, I think it, these are investments that could have a really high payoff, helping people get back on track. And I hope that we, we see that and make, and make those investments. I mean, the unfortunate truth is that school districts in relatively better off areas tend to have more resources. So to the extent that decisions are being made at the local level, we're not gonna necessarily see the sort of investments we need in the places where we need them. So I think there, there's really a role for federal and, and state help with addressing this. So I'm going to pivot a little bit. You and I are both working from home. I think the audience can yeah. tell that. <laughs> yes, um, so yeah. <laughs> we're, we're fortunate that, of course, we're able to work from home because of the, the nature of, of our jobs. So uh, to what extent do you think uh, working from home will persist into the future? And sort of what are the benefits and the costs of, of this kind of work? Yeah, that, that's a really good but good question. And I've been having you know, some, some back and forth with some of my economist colleagues on that. There are people, uh, uh, of course, as I'm sure you, you've seen, who think that this experience is going to lead to fundamental transformations in the way that people work, that, that very large numbers of people are going to shift to working entirely from home. Um, and I mean, there's certainly great things about working from home. You don't, especially if you live in a big city, you don't have to commute to the office, which can be time consuming and expensive. It's easier to make your work life mesh with your personal life. If I need to have the plumber come to the house, I don't need to worry about somebody being here to, to let them in because we're here all the time. Um, and there, there's potential benefits for employers as well. They may be able to save on office space. They may be able to expand their recruiting pool. So there's lots to say that's good about having people working from home. But I also think there's some real negatives. Um, in, in a lot of work activity, an important, important part of, of the, the organization being productive is interaction among people. When new people are hired, it's inculcating them into the organization's culture. It's people interacting and coming up with better ideas and you know all kinds of benefits to, to that sort of interaction. And I think there's also a lot of benefits to having similar organizations in the you know, in, a, in a geographic area. So you you have interaction and exchange of employees among those those organizations. And I think, if everybody's working at home, you lose all of that. So if I had to make a prediction, and I'm a really bad prognosticator, <laughs> but if I had to make a prediction, it would be that what we're likely to see is some significant number of people working at home a day or two or maybe three a week, but that significant numbers of people, you know, most people still spending significant time you know, at the at the workplace. It's kind of interesting. You, you hear the, these tech companies talking about, you know, they're, they're gonna have more people working at home, but then at the same time, many of them are investing in office space. So Facebook has been talking about having more of its workforce working at home, but it just leased at the same time, a big office building in Manhattan and took all of the office space in that building because they're planning to be there. And just a couple of days ago, Google made an announcement about investing you know, a lot of money, you know, billions of dollars in new downtown, you know, new office space in urban areas. So, you know, my, my bet is that yes, there will be changes, but there are a lot of advantages to people working together in person and that 
you know, we're going to see more of a hybrid model than people just working at home. I don't, what do you think? What are you doing at so pretty much the same thing. Well, <laughs> right now, of course, like everyone, we're pretty much uh, working from home, but though we have uh, folks popping into the office every day and spending some time in the office, I think just like you said, we expect to be back in the office on a more frequent basis when it's safe. Um, but we, we will probably rely more on working from home because we've been able to demonstrate that it works, that, that right. we've been able to save the commute and um, focus on our work at home, except for when, uh, you know, the, the little child comes along and tugs on a sleeve or, <laughs> or the contractor walks by with a hammer. But um, yes, I think, I think we certainly will be in more of a hybrid uh, mode than we were in the past. Yeah. So uh, do you think that's also true for the University of Maryland? Will, will the way that universities teach their students change? Will, there, or will, will all the students still be in lecture halls and, uh, and the like, or will there be some blending going on in the future? I, I think there'll probably be some blending. Um, one of the classes I teach is a class of working professionals. And I, I, they used to come to a fixed location and I would meet with them for three hours every Tuesday morning. I don't think we're ever doing that again. They really liked having pre-recorded lectures online and you know an interactive online session once a week. And so I think I'll, I'm going to keep doing that. Even with the undergraduate students, I think that some of this experience will accelerate the move towards uh, flipped classrooms where we have pre-recorded lectures. And then when we actually meet with the students, it's more interactive. There, there isn't any particular reason why if all you're going to do is lecture, people have to come to a big room to watch you. Yeah. So, so I mean, so I think it, I think we've we we we've learned some things, and I suspect, as you're suggesting, that's true of other organizations too. Yes, I I agree. Well, it's been great talking with you, um, and so now um, I. I know we're going to go to some live Q and A, and so I look forward to uh, the questions that will be posed to you from the audience. Great, thank you very much, John. Thank you. Well, that was great. We're live now, and we have a few minutes to pose some questions to Dr. Abraham. Uh, but before I go to those questions, I know we had a poll going. I don't know the latest results. So I was wondering if uh, the folks who are monitoring the poll could actually um, tell us what uh, the preponderance of votes were for. Hey, John, this is Andrew in, in the background. And uh, the poll, as uh, they've taken it right now, we've had over 363 answers. And we asked the question, uh, how will remote work arrangements change post pandemic? 73% of people said workers will split time between the office and home. And then uh, second to that is that 25% workers will continue working remotely and occasionally go to the office. And lastly, at 3%, workers will return to the office full time at pre-pandemic levels. So that pretty much is in accord with what uh, Dr. Abraham and I were surmising as well. So that's great. So uh, we have some wonderful questions that we've gotten from the audience. And so let me just leap right into them, if I may, Dr. Abraham. Uh, so here's an interesting one from Mary. The COVID relief bill extends unemployment insurance benefits through Labor Day and raises the weekly benefit level. Some have alleged that this might disincentivize return to work. What are your thoughts on that? There, there as you suggest, have, has, have been concerns raised about um, what more generous unemployment benefits will do to employers' ability to fill jobs, basically. Um, and I guess, honestly, I am not too worried about the effects of, of what we're doing with unemployment insurance. Um, there's sort of, there are two reasons for that. One is that you know, unemployment is still relatively high and there are lots of people looking for jobs and in an environment like that, I worry less about the disincentive effects of, of unemployment benefits. Even at, at the individual level, if I'm somebody who's unemployed and I'm collecting unemployment benefits, you know, I know that they're not gonna last forever. And if I'm offered an attractive job, um, I, it, it makes sense 
for me to take it. So, you know, ba based on what we've seen in, in, in past recessions, there have been similar concerns raised about, you know, unemployment benefits lasting too long and, and, and that sort of thing. And what the evidence really seems to suggest is that it doesn't have too much effect on people's willingness to take a job. So I mean, it's not to say there's no, no, no reason to be concerned, but it doesn't rank very high on my list of, of concerns. Thank you. So now I have to ask a question about some BLS data. Tom uh, writes that the BLS reports that real wages rose more than 3% in 2020. Uh, is this because higher quintile earners remain employed, but lower, lower uh, earners did not? And is this another example of widening inequality? Um, that's a really astute question. I, I think a, a lot of people looking at these real wage data haven't thought about the issue you raised, which is that the, the real wages are just an average for the people who are working. And because it's the case that during this recession, lower wage people have been a lot more likely to lose their jobs, um, that is affecting the real wage numbers. So um, I, I haven't seen evidence that tracks um, you know, for people who are, you know, holding constant the kinds of work that that people are doing, what's happened to, to wages. Those data are out there. I, I just haven't looked at them, but um, you can't conclude from the real wage data that, that wages are going up, that's for sure. So we have a question about disparities. Uh, what do you think is the reason that black and Latino kids are suffering more than white kids or kids from other ethnic groups when it comes to education in the current environment under the pandemic? Yeah, um, another great question. The, uh, what we're seeing, I think, has a lot to do with the relationship between being black and being Hispanic and family income levels. Uh, you know, Black and Hispanic families are unfortunately disproportionately at the lower end of the, the income distribution. Um, that has effects at the household level because you know, the, their home environment may be less conducive to online learning. They may not have access to the broadband internet and the computers that are needed for effective online learning. Um, it also has an effect at the school district level because um, you know, school districts with in lower income areas have fewer resources to help their students. So all of that, I think, is feeding into the, um, the relative disadvantage that Black and Hispanic students have been experiencing. So this question has to do with working from home. So what would be the impacts from permanent work from home? In, in terms of the economic impacts? Uh, yeah, I think I think probably some psychological impacts that probably <laughs> that too. That too. <laughs> yeah, no, so that's something that a lot of people have have been thinking about. So one, and it's a case where I think it makes a really big difference whether you're talking about what I think most of the poll respondents were talking about, which is people working at home some of the time and going into the office some of the time, versus people really being at home all the time. One of the things that you would you think about in terms of an adjustment that would need to be made is what happens to all of the businesses down in downtown areas that existed to serve the war office workers who are coming to those areas. Um, if people aren't going to the office at all, th those businesses are, are unlikely to survive. And they're, you know, so there may be a lot of economic dislocation around that that you know, is been occurring now temporarily, but may become permanent. It's a little less clear to me if people are going into the office three days a week, say, how big of a disruption that's gonna be. If it used to be the case that I went out to lunch a couple of times a week with my colleagues, and now I'm going into the office three days a week, maybe I still do that. And so the restaurants in the area around my office do just fine. Uh, I think it's a little bit harder to tell, but I think, you know, we certainly can expect some dislocation uh, affecting those downtown um, businesses that, you know, it, so if people aren't coming into work. 
So uh, Chris uh, makes a statement that he wants you to uh, either uh, agree with or dispute. And so the statement is the nature of employment may mean that the employer has the advantage and job seekers will need to accept lower compensation. And, and so do you think that is true and, and whether there's a policy problem here? I wish I could ask Chris a, <laughs> a question about, about that. Um, so I'm going to uh, interpret the question as relating to um, the pandemic and actually, is, is the question related to work from home? Uh, I, I think it more had, had more to do with the uh, bargaining power. That's how I'm reading it between uh, okay. the employer and the, and the worker. Um, yeah, no, I, I think in general, in recessions, the balance of bargaining power shifts. And I think we're certainly seeing that now. I don't see that as something that's permanent necessarily. If the labor market gets tighter, if, if employment returns to pre-pandemic levels, then the balance of bargaining power will shift again. So I, I partly agree and partly disagree, I guess. Um, so Anne writes uh, about uh, productivity data that I uh, were near and dear to my heart when I worked at the BLS at the end. So uh, how does the relationship between working in the office and productivity show up in the data, if it does? Oh, great question. Um, and that, I think that's one of the things that's going to affect what work ends up looking like going forward. I mean, in the productivity statistics, the time that people spend working at home, if they're on the payroll, it, it, it should show up in the way that work in the office does. But there's also a substantive question, which is what is the impact on having people working at home going to be on, on, on real productivity? Um, a lot of workers, when you ask them about how productive they were working at home during the pandemic said, you know, I, I was more productive. But if you ask employers, you get somewhat mixed results, but they are more likely to say, mm, this really came at a cost to productivity. And I think that's a somewhat open question, you know, about what the productivity impacts really are going to be, um, you know, whether the you know, lack of interruptions and whatever from working at home, whether that offsets the, the loss of interaction and exchange of ideas and, and all of that. Um, and I, I think ultimately will have an effect on whether we're all right that we're going to see a big increase in working from home or not. So we have time for a couple more questions. So Peter asks, after the Great Recession, we saw a lot of new small businesses start. Can yeah. we expect to see the same with this recession? We actually already are seeing a lot of uh, evidence of business formation. The Census Bureau has a new set of data, what they call their business formation statistics. And they are based on filing for an employer identification number. And the, based on historical data, the Census Bureau has a way of figuring out which of these are really likely to turn into small businesses with employees and which are really going to be just you know, somebody doing some work on their own. They have really shot up. The, the pace of new business formation during the pandemic has just been astonishing. <laughs> and you know, it's a, a little up in the air again, whether these businesses are going to survive or not and you know, actually grow and employ people. But it's been a very interesting part of you know, what we've seen during the pandemic is that burst of business formation. Are we seeing deaths though uh, that are sort of offsetting that? Uh, those data won't come in until later, unfortunately. The, the, the neat thing about the business formation data is that you can see it more or less right away when people file for the employer identification number. Um, see. And then our last question that I'm able to pose to you today, uh, do we think the pandemic will lead to any long-term impacts on workforce demographics? And I think really also just in the nature of jobs and industries, examples being more manufacturing, more automation, et cetera. Um, I, yeah, I don't know. I mean, they're, they're, they're in terms of demographics, you know, there clearly have been some short-term effects with you know, parents with small children, women with small children, especially withdrawing from the labor force. I am, I'm optimistic that they will come 
back. Um, but it, it may it may have to some extent the pandemic may have to have some extent accelerated trends we were seeing already towards automation of certain types of tasks. Um, you know, a a business that didn't feel like it could have its employees coming in in person and was thinking about automating some part of its activities, there was probably a little shove towards doing that. So I don't know that I, I suspect that what it has done is to change the time path of things that were likely to happen anyway, is my guess. But. Well, I wish we could pose to you the other wonderful questions that have, were sent in to us, but unfortunately we have to wrap this session up. So Dr. Abraham, thank you so much for sharing your insights with us. For the, the audience, uh, thank you all for attending and for posting your wonderful questions. Please don't forget to rate the session. And we'll see you at the next session on WCRI's pharmacy-related research at 1.55 p.m. Eastern. Remember, you have to start that session from the conference agenda on the Whova app. Thank you very much, Dr. Abraham. Thank you, John.